Well, without further ado, let me introduce you Silke Helfrich. Uh, she's a fellow commoner and a common scholar. She's the co-founder of uh, Commons Institute and Commons Strategies Group. And she's the editor of multiple books on the commons, like the wealth of the um, commons, the patterns of commoning, and most recently co-authored with David Bollier, Fair, Free, and Free, Fair, and Alive, The Insurgent Power of the Commons, which really, if you want to get into commons, this is the best place to begin nowadays. I think uh, she will be talking more about why, why, why fund commons and why are, what to do with uh, this and what, how, what's the right way to deal with it. So dear Silke, really happy to have you tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for this invitation. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to see what's going on in, in Amsterdam. Um, and I feel like that debate on the commons and commoning is reaching new stage. Uh, so uh, we are, I'm working for about 14, 15 years now in what I call connecting the dots. Like I started with that question, what does free software, what do free software and seeds have in common? And the answer it's basic, is basically that they are means of production and we need them to reproduce our livelihoods and to create the conditions, the living conditions we live in. So the seeds usually attached to land and the source code use, usually attached to the digital world. And I came to realize pretty early that that classical distinction between the traditional commons or natural commons on the one side, on the one hand, like land and water and meadows and so on and forests, and the cultural commons, social commons on the other side, like, like housing and knowledge and health and education are closely linked together. You can't separate them. So we, we began to work on um, a framework that takes um, Peter Linebow's insight. Peter Linebow is a historian, pretty well-known famous historian from the US. And I think his plan is to rewrite the history uh, of mankind from a communist perspective, that is from below, right? Um, and, and his insight is like, there's no commons without commoning. So we had to understand as we went on investigating the field, what, what does commoning actually mean and what does it mean to people? And after all, how does it work? How do you do that? And, and there was another insight that I would add to that first sentence, there is no commons without commoning, and there is no commoning without conscious governance. And once you do that conscious governance, conscious commons governance, so to speak, and you create the conditions for actually doing commoning, you transform as a person. That's what we realize. So that really does something with you. That, that, that does not only change the circumstances and the world around you, but it changes also your inner life. So you become a commoner in other, in other words. So what does it mean to be a commoner, to think like a commoner? And then, oh, of course, the automatic translation doesn't know what commoning means. Oh, that's a headache to translate it into several languages. And it, we could have a funny conversation about this over a beer later tonight. Um, so, so then we went on questioning ourselves. So how does commoning work? And what do we need to do in order to enact it? You might remember David Graeber, Rest in Power, who once said, each day we get up and do capitalism. Why don't we do something else? So the basic question for writing Free, Fair and Alive, the book just mentioned by Sergio was, well, why don't we do something else? And the answer is because we don't know how. So basically we are missing the tools. We don't know the tools, the methods. And we came up with a, a way of describing how commoning works using the notion of patterns. And I saw on the website of the New Women, is, is that the right way to pronounce it, New Women, um, that you talk about the principles of commoning. I'd like to slightly challenge that idea and say, hey, it's 
it's not about principles. You know, principles can be very ethical, very broad, very big. And at the end of the day, you don't know how to apply them because they are so kind, kind of, they come from a big philosophical mind or God or Godfather or, or, or whatever community moral, and you don't know how to apply them. And that's precisely the problem. So we use a notion which is called patterns. I won't explain where it comes from, but it's more practical. It's more grounded. It's like a design tool. And it's a design tool that it is context sensitive. And whenever you use it, like, mm, I want to do commons friendly financing, how do I do that? You will immediately realize that when doing commons friendly financing, you will open up a whole new world, like a new problem will pop up, like, oh, I need to be transparent in order to do commons friendly financing. So how do I create transparency? Mm, and then you come up with a new problem, like, oh, I need a sphere of trust in order to have transparency among people. So how do I create a sphere of trust? And then you come up with a new problem, which is mm, in order to create a sphere of trust, I might uh, have a certain way of decision taking. So you need to reflect upon your decision taking. And I guess you see where I'm going. So you start talking about money and you realize that it's not about money. It's about everything. It's about talking about governance. It's about talking about your relationships. It's about creating this space, a sphere of trust and security where people can express themselves, also the hurtful things. So it's about talking about the whole. And so the way we set it up in our book, and here I, I, I prepared a little slide for you, is we call it the triad of commoning. So when you talk about commoning, Andrea, is it, yeah, is it possible to show that slide? When we talk about commoning, you basically in a, in a conventional discourse, you would say that our economy is based on the commons, right? So because we take water and land and forest and material and knowledge out of the social commons, convert it into commodities and sell it on the market. That is what a commons-based economy is. The market is a commons-based economy, literally taking everything out of the commons, converting it, converting it into a commodity and then selling it on the market. So we advocate for a commons creating economy that would actually mean that rather than producing commodities, you produce commons. That is, you change this, so to speak, socioeconomic characteristics of your produce. And your, your, your example is a perfect, your, the, the new moment is a perfect example because what you actually wanna do, you wanna take housing out of the market. That is, you want to make sure that a dwelling is not understood as a commodity as anything else anymore. And this is changing the socioeconomic quality of a dwelling. And this is precisely what commons creating production means. But as I said, production, that's what we call in this slide provisioning. So how do you now, how do we meet people, people's needs? How do we provision people? How do we actually produce what we need for a living? This is connected to what you see below to the peer governance. When you want to produce differently, you need to take different decisions. You need to organize your institution in a different way. You need to see how to deal with, with conflicts. You need to deal with applying sanctions if necessary. You need to create uh, transparency and a sphere of trust. And after all, you need to keep commons and commerce distinct in order not to allow the finance mentalities and the market mentalities to, so to speak, um, abuse of your commons. And this, as I said, changes the social life. So the relationship within your commons. And therefore, we talk about a triad of commoning where provisioning, that is the economic part, peer governance, which is the institutional organizational part, and the social life, which is clearly the social cultural part, all belong together and influence each other. And you will see in, in peer governance that we have a pattern on finance commons provisioning, but just actually now it's called commons friendly financing. And it's my next slide. 
I'm sorry, the next slide will be in German. We, we, we've put the main ideas of the book in a pattern language about commoning and said, okay, commoning is a way to actually transform your economic, political, social, cultural relationships. Go to the next slide. And one of these patterns is commons friendly financing, which you can see here. And on the slide, you see one of these cards where we describe the core idea of commons friendly financing, which means, first of all, you need to combine several sources of financing in such a way that you don't create structural dependencies. And actually, when I saw the financing plan of your project, I said, okay, is 8% versus how was it? 68% of the GLS bank really a good ratio in order to be structural independent from external financing and the bank? That's certainly something to discuss. So it would be very welcome to combine such financing mechanisms that are based on the idea of commoning and solidarity financing in and by itself. And there are several mechanisms for doing so, like crowdfunding, the one you start today is one of it. And it's important once you do that, as I said, and you can see it here in the card, on the sides of the cards, you have six other patterns, which are precisely those new problems you open up once you start discussing financing the commons. Reflect a moment on financing your project. And you will think about financing the commons and taking uh, dwelling and housing and land out of the market. Does not only a cure at the moment of production, it also needs to occur at, in the future over decades and decades to go. So you need to make sure that you find property arrangements that actually make sure that once you've converted a housing project into a commons, it doesn't fall back into a market. And as far as I understood, uh, you actually managed to do so via a, a, a foundation created for that specific, specific purpose. Once you do that, you will need to deal with the question over time, how do I finance what we need in order to maintain that big project, but according to different needs of people. And you go a level deeper and you say, okay, how do we do that, that perhaps we recognize that in a commons world, not that the logic is not fit for that. I only get, I don't know, 10 square meters if I, if I pay $100 a month, but I can actually contribute what I have according to my capabilities. So how do we make sure in the future that the financing of this huge housing project is also according to commoning patterns? So you go deeper and you realize that you will need to find ways to, for instance, co-budget your financing mechanisms. Co-budget <coughs> is a specific software you can use, which some so common projects use are, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost, almost done, I guess I'm over my time. Or you will, you will um, realize that there will be a moment where perhaps once a year, you open your room, a room in your community, which where you just reflect together upon your money culture. Because as I said in the beginning, if we want to talk about financing the commons or commons friendly financing, at the end of the day, we talk about everything else, about governance relationships and our culture. And this is what I would recommend you should kind of inscribe into your project that financing the commons doesn't, it doesn't certainly start today and it won't certainly end once you, success, you successfully finish your crowdfunding. It will be an ongoing topic that you have to reflect upon in order to nurture a, a culture which nurtures the commoner in us. Because as I said at the beginning, commoning changes everything and first of all, ourselves. I keep it there.
Thank you, Zilke. Here's your crash course to uh, commoning people. Um, I have a few uh, um, messages I will take with me is that uh, it also already makes me reflect how our conscious governance models, which we will be talking uh, a little bit later on, makes us already commoners. Uh, I do take the challenge, the why uh, call it principles and not patterns. Maybe we will discuss this with our uh, also media team and, and so on and uh, rebrand ourselves. Uh, but I don't want this to be a superficial branding, but an actual embracing of understanding to think in terms of patterns. Um, uh, you have a great point about warning us about structural uh, dependencies. I guess we will hear uh, a bit later on as well, but uh, since we are some sort of a, a pilot project where the city does not have their financial instruments ready yet, uh, that's why we have these dependencies created with uh, GLS, which is still not the worst you can have, of course. Um, but, um, and the last point I get, and I think we will reflect on that as well is how uh, yeah, it is not at this moment that the, the we have to, to worry about how do we finance this uh, uh, in a commons friendly way, but uh, it's a long term vision and especially once the building pays itself back, then the co political question, how do we generate this value uh, and uh, channel it to good uh, uses will be uh, much more important in 20, 30 years actually. Um, Checking the questions and maybe daring to rephrase them a little bit, I would like to ask, so you see we have this firewall between access to the, the space, like provisioning of space and the provisioning of finance, right? Like we don't expect just like in the marketplace, say if you have the money, then you can have the house. Um, therefore, while our inhabitants and uh, community are potentially commoners, our um, funders aren't. So my question is, why should these non-commoners uh, choose to um, have this uh, financial provisioning of a, a commons-based project? Like, what is it in them politically, emotionally, economically, socially, um, how to kind of share that that vision uh, beyond those who have that affinity with Cummins. That was my way of rephrasing Andrea's silly question. Oh, it's a it's it's a beautiful question because it allows me to um, reflect a minute upon what is the Commons all about, and it's about a paradigm shift, certainly. And a paradigm shift we urgently need to address the major problems we face today uh starting i mean if you only look at the corona crisis let's not talk about the climate crisis here right but if you only look at the corona crisis and you look at the basic questions which are not being asked which however are the basic questions in the commons it for instance one of it who will own the vaccine and how will the vaccine be distributed? And how do we organize research for such an important thing to meet really people's needs um, all over the world and not only those who can afford it, et cetera, et cetera. Or those where certain nation states protect really their citizens where others don't, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the really important questions that we deal with in the comms. We are questioning the basic pillars our socioeconomic systems are based upon which includes obviously property. And if you then, then think about, and it's an old idea, we'll bring you back to an old idea and combine it perhaps with one new idea. The old idea is that there are certain so-called fictitious commodities, right? And land, money, and labor are one of them. And this might be a challenge for Andrea or the architects among you. So how was the division of labor between the producers and the inhabitants in the future. If you think about housing as a commons, can we think about building as commoning? There are amazing projects out there like Vivi House in Vienna who are precisely doing this. How do we transform the building process in order to create a different relationships to the flats that will change the way we live in there? 
and I'm I'm sure you have thought a lot about this, and it would be interesting to 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 further transform these processes along the whole production line as we do in the food chain. So, but now just just to finish that idea, so it, think about not having land, money, and labor as a common. So, Andrea would have worked a little bit less as providing his paid labor for that project for the future inhabitants, right? And we would have organized it in a slightly different way, but obviously with division of labor because we don't want to bake our own bread, all of us, right? Fine. And then we take land out of the, of, of, uh, of the market as you do, perfect. And finally, we take knowledge out of the market as Wikipedia does and many free software projects do. And you can use uh, open accounting software and you have it. And, and we could think about free knowledge in order to produce vaccines. And you think about that and you will realize that this changes everything. It changes the way we share the risk of production. It changes the way of which we, at the end of the day, think about the so-called market laws. Because economists want to tell us that there is a, the law of the market of demand and supply which determines the price tag. But that's untrue. There are people behind the price tags. So if we take land, money, labor, and knowledge out of the market, we will gain price sovereignty. And can you imagine what it means for our cities, municipalities, and governments to gain price sovereignty about the land where the people live? It, it, it actually means gaining structural independency from the market. And therefore I would advocate, and therefore I really welcome your project because I think it's a prototype of what we would call in the future a commons public partnership. So I cannot think about any municipality that should not be highly interested in creating such pilot projects, giving it a legal framework like a commons public partnership and say, this is the way we make sure that future generations won't have speculation on the housing market. That, that's what it is for. Yeah, I, I'm already seeing some uh, re reactions uh, where of course, you know, this, there is no substitute to actual uh, clapping and, and cheering, but would you be kind to show reactions uh, to Silke in the chat with a word, with an emoji or with your questions? I will be still trying to recap it. Uh, I will combine two questions that I've seen. One by Susanna uh, asking, um, well, does Oops, lost it now, um, is a major ambition of commoning uh, to counter and change capitalistic systems in that sense. And I see uh, more, maybe more focused questions. How does this take us closer to having decommodified neighborhoods? So like you've mentioned, within our organization, within our structure, how we can be decommodifying our labor, our space, and our finances. And indeed, this is like what with our emphasis on, of course, care and being able to uh, and consciously sharing uh, care among us. We, we will be becoming commoners in multiple ways, hopefully. But how does that translate beyond the uh, uh, borders of our building, beyond the walls, so to speak? And how does that influence uh, uh, the neighborhood. And Andrea does say, uh, I'd like a two hours lecture from Silke. These 15 minutes are too little. I totally agree. Um, yeah, so like how does having a, a, a space that is indeed uh, as property and even as, a, as the means of production of space is taken out of the market, how does that influence and how can it influence the rest of the neighborhood and beyond the whole uh, systemic relations around us? Million dollar question, I know. Unmute, oh. okay. No? No? Okay. So I'd like to I'd like to pick up another comment in the, which I've seen in the chat, which is um, that idea of well, competition also drives innovation and uh, should it be without market forces, etc. That that's so interesting because 
the way it changes everything is the way how it changes our thinking because I didn't say that we should do research, drug research or whatever distribution without market forces. I just said we should organize it in a different way and organize production and con contribution uh, and distribution according to common commoning principles or commoning patterns, which then means that the question who decides what, who sets the price, how, for what purpose, and for what communities will be simply different. If you look at, in this field, DNDI, the Drug for Neglected Disease Initiative, you will actually see how this, how this happens in the drug sector for now 15, 20 years uh, quite successfully. It's a matter of governance design. It's not about either or. This is the first thing that it, so the, the first major impact it will have, I think, is, is that you stop thinking in either or terms. So decommodification doesn't mean that there's no money anymore, that there's no market anymore. It just doesn't mean that money rules anymore and that the market rules anymore. And it, that we don't buy into that idea that there would be a market law as if it were, was a law of nature, forgetting that there are people behind setting the prices. Or, and I, I've put it into the chat, please read this because I don't know if you can, if, how, how to say this in English. It's about um, making a living with each, miteinander, nicht aneinander. Does this make sense in your, in your language? So because what you usually have the logic of making money in the market economy is that um, you need other people's labor in order to make a profit yourself. So it's not about not making any profit, not making any money. It's about doing it in a different logic. And this again and again makes me reflect on how do I reshape my organization? How do I reshape my decision-making process? How do I reshape the flow of resources? Let's take a very easy example, which will probably help you in um, dealing with re resource conflicts in the new amount in the future. In the marketplace, we have only one way of allocation. Isn't that right? It's buying and selling mediated through money. That's the only way of um, mediation we have. And it's said to be the most efficient one. The problem with that is we have very different things we deal with. with. If we want to share knowledge, it gets more as we share it. If we want to share an apple or land, each of us becomes less. And still, we use one and the same allocation mechanism to allocate both different resources. So it's not logic and it doesn't make sense and still we use it. We use the same patterns and institutions to deal with very different things. This is like giving the same drug to a baby, a newborn or uh, an elder strong person. It doesn't make sense. So what we suggest as a commoning pattern is decommodify knowledge contribute and share. This is what we're used to do in the Wikipedia. This is what we are used to do in the free software. This is what we do with open design. And I'm pretty sure that the design of this beautiful new building will be openly shared so that it can be um, uh, replicated in other areas in other conditions and contexts. By the way, it's for apples or land or money, we would rather pool, cap and mutualize it which is a whole other logic. And still it's not just buying and selling a tip for that logic. So what it does, deco it's decommodifying our brains. Can I put it that way? It will teach you thinking and you will see the comments all over. It's like putting a lens on and being unable to see the world the same way you have done before. Thank you, Silke. I want to react on that point about, well, the design can be open sourced, but it's may perhaps harder to like uh, document and open source the kind of social relations and these relations of governance we build, right? So uh, while we kind of have the conscious 
responsibility on our shoulders that, okay, the, the things we are prototyping here in terms of institutional design um, can be the blueprint for what you call commons public partnerships in the future, especially we will hear from Mariah in a bit about how many more uh, social um, housing co-ops they have in mind. Um, maybe in order to better uh, develop it ourselves and in order to be able to share it, those pattern cards that you showed us, are they, uh, um, are they available for actually like helping us to build uh, institutions or is it just uh, the historical <laughs> cards that we've seen? Oh yeah, oh. oh, that's a nice question. Well, they are about to be printed within two weeks, but only in German. Uh, we are now writing them. Uh, we are we are putting the the ideas in in the internet on a federated wiki, also in English and in, in Spanish. But um, putting short text on a card deck and making it still shorter is a lot of work. So if you if you if you agree with having something similar in in the internet, it will be there available within a few weeks. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, can you have an actual uh, round of applause uh, if Andrea can unmute everyone so that we have this <laughs> of togetherness for a moment? Oh no, I think it's not working. You can mute all, but you can't unmute all. These are again the institutional designs that uh, Zoom imposes on us, I guess. Selja, may, may I, rather than saying goodbye or with my saying me saying goodbye, still make yeah. a comment on that. These are nice ideas, but not a bit utopistic in real life comment. I think that's 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 very important to me. The beauty of the patterns approach is, is they are rooted in practice. Whatever we've done and written in that book and put on that card card deck is based on things that people do, not what we have invented. It's not about ideas, it's about real practice. So if you really have that question, ask and go and ask for the people who are doing this why why they are doing this and you will see that there are a great many reasons for changing the things we are used to do towards a more free fair in the life world okay thank you thank you Zilke. i 